How much time do I have, by the way? An hour. An hour. Okay. So before I start, let me just say that I'm very grateful for the courtesy appointment, and I thank all the faculty who voted for it, and I thank the students who pushed for it a little bit. So I think there's great complementarity between what I do and what's done in the department, especially in the HLT groups. So I'm very, very happy to, to be here. Uh, my name is Mihai Surdian, and this is joint work with my postdoc, Peter Jensen, student from computer science, Daniel Fried, and two of your students, Rebecca and Gus. And I'm going to talk today about how to teach computers to answer non fact eight questions. So I found this great list uh, written by what's called the search guru at Google, Amit Singhal, who's a computer scientist specializing in NLP. And these are the four biggest technical challenges for Google, according to him. One is using the knowledge graph. If you don't know, the knowledge graph is a graph constructed by Google mainly from Wikipedia pages where the nodes are entities, such as person names, location names, or numeric entities, such as dates. And links are relations between them. So using this graph, they can answer questions such as, when was Barack Obama born? Or who are the grandchildren of George H. Bush, right? By traversing the children link twice. So that's one, using that efficiently. Two is speech recognition. No need to explain that. Third one is what they call natural language understanding, which is sort of a hand-waving thing for uh, worse senses is ambiguation, understanding that Apple could be a fruit or a company, sentiment analysis, is this blog post happy or sad, hedging, you know, are you actually making a statement or hedging around it? And the last one is conversational search, where you interact with with a computer, computer could be a mobile phone or it could be an actual laptop or computer, uh, through natural uh, language, right? You don't use queries based on keywords. You use natural language. So I think this list is awesome for many reasons. The first one is that if you look at this, this is all natural language processing, computational linguistics. There is no word about big data, no buzzword here, no big data, no wearable technology, no apps. It's all NLP. So this is great for you know, people in this room. Second of all, this is my current research area, so it's nice to see that it's on the list. And this, you see it in publications, this is also known as question answering. What I mean by this is this. This is also a test to see how old you are. Uh, I don't know how many of you actually seen this movie. Uh, it's a great movie. It's one of the first instances of uh, AI in, or good instances of AI in, at Hollywood. Uh, so you basically want to interact with a computer in a natural way, right? You want to ask questions and you want to get answers back. All right, so why, why is that useful? First of all, you're going to get better search if you do that, because if you actually use natural language instead of, by the way, as a, as a parenthesis, the average query length at Google is 2.3 words, meaning less than three words, right? You cannot really convey your information in two words. Right? But if you use natural language with you know, an actual question, your information need is much better defined than a two-word query. Uh, it's a natural search. You don't have to think about the language. As another parenthesis, before coming here, I worked at a startup in, in the legal space. And what we found out was that each, each law firm has somewhere in the basement, they have librarian wizards who specialize in the query language for Westlaw, which is a search engine for the legal domain which has a very weird language for answering, uh, for asking questions. It's so weird that they actually have a job where your job is to write queries for the attorneys. Right? So you don't want to do that. Right? You want to interact with the computer in a natural way. And for whom is this good? Obviously, anybody in a time-critical situation. Right? If you're in a time-critical situation, you don't have the time to think about how should I phrase this as a query or as a, or as a sequence of queries. Right? This could be a doctor where you're asking, What's the best drug for this patient who's, who has the symptoms and you want to avoid the side effects and so on, right? So you'd like to interact with the computer in a natural way to ask for that. Emergency relief workers, you know, how do I bandage this type of wound, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, automated technical support. This is a multi-billion dollar business where you, you pay people to answer questions when most of those questions can actually be answered automatically. And question answering will take care of that. And ultimately, least but definitely not least, you. Right? So you have a search engine on your phone. Right? And right now, you can kind of talk to it through, through Siri. I'll say more about that. But it would be very nice to actually have a very natural interaction with that machine. So there are many, many applications that are very important. So let's define this a little bit. So question answering, in my opinion, 
is the task of answering natural language questions with small fragments of text. And I italicize the important parts. First of all, the input is a natural language question. It's not a query. Right? And the output is text. It's not a list of URLs. Right? It's not a web page, the, the thing you get, you know, the list of 10 pages you get from Google. It's actual text. And in this talk, I'll focus on non-factored QA, where the answer is, uh, uh, contains one or more sentences or paragraphs. And they are possibly aggregated from multiple places. They don't have to come from the same document. There is very little research to date on this topic, even though it's actually really common. So when I was at Yahoo Research, I looked at query logs, and I found that even though search engines do not support this type of queries, and people have been trained to use the language of keywords, right? People still ask non-facted questions in a search engine. At a very large percent, I don't remember why it was like 15%. So given these conditions that you're not supposed to do that, and people still do it, I find it you know, amazing that the percentage is so high. So it, they're very, very common. So before we look into detail of what, what they are, I will say a couple of slides on what it's not. So non-factored question answering is, not surprisingly, not factored QA. Factored QA is when the answer is a non-phrase. So for example, what is Barack Obama's date of birth? The answer is just this. It's just a simple non-phrase. Right? And as I mentioned before, they can answer this precisely using the knowledge graph. And it's been studied to death you know, in the past 15 years or so. So there are very good models for this, even in, in industry, including Google and IBM's uh, Watson uh, question answering engine. It's also not this. So I'm not interested in Siri. The reason I'm not interested in Siri is because Siri, regardless of you know, the marketing they do around it, it's a domain-specific question answering engine. Right? They specialize on a few actions, right? Making appointments, reminders, telling you your battery level, even though it's displayed right there. Uh, <laughs> so very, very specific things, right? And, and you can implement that with rules. Right? You don't actually need natural language understanding for this because you have a very limited number of actions which can be encoded with a very well-defined grammar. So I don't really care about this. What I care about is answering questions like this. How is CO2 first incorporated in the Calvin cycle and getting an answer that explains that the cycle begins by incorporating CO2 from the air into organic molecules and so on. Right? This type of things. Right, so you see here that the answer is longer than a noun phrase, but it's concise. It's the smallest piece of text that answers your information need. It's not a list of URL. We're not taking you to the Wikipedia page. We're giving you the answers, right? So you can easily see how this could be plugged into a mobile phone where you talk to the machine and the machine actually answers back like hell in, in the movie. Uh, you have to do it open domain because the user can ask about anything, not like, you know, in Siri, just schedule a reminder. So if, for example, if you look at Yahoo Answers, Yahoo Answers is a question answering uh, uh, website where people go and ask questions and other people answer. There are more than 300, this was done two or three years ago. So two or three years ago, there were more than almost 400,000 answered how to questions. How do I do something? For example, how do you quiet a squeaky door? And this guy really likes WD-40. How does a helicopter fly? And this was actually a very good answer on you know, where the air flows over the rollers and blades. Right? So the questions could be about anything. So that means that your model has to be robust to answer them. So how would you do this? Ideally, you want to convert the question and answer candidates to logic forms, logic formulas. For this is an example. We're not getting into logic formula, uh, uh, predicate logic and all that stuff uh, here. So all your students are smart. You can phrase this as for any student, for any x. If x is a student and x is at ua, then x is smart. Right? Very nice. So it's a very nice theory. And you can, then you can use any gen generic inference engine from take your AI course. And any inference engine would be able to basically infer one from the other. In reality, this doesn't work. You can write very nice publication, but it doesn't work uh, for many reasons. First of all, you have to convert the text, both in the answer, but more importantly, you know, everything that you index on Google has to be converted to logic forms. If you do it manually, it's really expensive. I was involved in a project before where they told us, I was involved basically to avoid doing this, 
But before I came on board, they tried to do this. They tried to manually convert the text into logic form so they can use you know, formal inferencing over those. And this was done over a biology textbook. I'll show examples in a second. And it cost them $10,000 a page. And the performance of the system was somewhere around 15% accuracy, meaning they were, they were able to answer correctly 15% of the questions. When I came on board, the first thing you do, you do a stupid information retrieval system where you're matching words. That system was doing 30% for two weeks of my time, not even two weeks, because I was doing other things. So it's really expensive, right? It's never complete. That's why they, they were able to answer only 15% of the questions, because it's never complete. The running, I don't know if you heard about Psych. Psych is an, is a, is an open domain uh, uh, ontology where they, they try to encode the words knowledge, another very you know, important pursuit. But the running joke about systems using Psych, you hear this all the time. If I only had that missing axiom, my, my inference would be complete. Right? You can never have that missing axiom. That you're never going to be able to encode the word knowledge. Right? It's never, all of it is never in one place. Right? So that's why you know, this, this project you know, stopped at about 15% coverage. Uh, if you want to avoid manual conversion and you want to do it automatically, you run into different problems. So my former advisor has a had, had a project called Extended Warnet. You're familiar with Warnet, right? It's, it's a semantic taxonomy which has synonymy and antonymy relations between words. And for each word, you have a definition called the gloss. And he ended up converting the glosses to logic forms. So again, he can do inferencing uh, on top of those. And it took forever. Because initially, they said, well, we're just going to run a parser. Then we're going to write an algorithm to convert the syntax, syntax into logic forms. But the parser fails. The parse speech tagger, which you know, is necessary for the parser, fails. Then your code to convert the, the syntax into logic form fails. So they ended up you know, basically redoing everything manually, right? So it took them about four years. So you cannot avoid this problem. So basically what I'm trying to say is that we need a robust approximation, at least today, the beginning of the 21st century. If we're talking 200 years, maybe all this is solved. But now we need a robust approximation to be able to handle these problems. And what I propose today is approximate the question answering task as two issues. The first one is, is this text structured like an answer? For example, if this text is elaborating on a topic, then this text is, is a probable answer for somebody asking about that topic. Right? And we're going to capture this type of text structures using discourse processing automatically. The second question is, is this text related to my question? Right, then you, you want to go way beyond matching words. Right? So uh, what I'm going to show today is a, mo is a model we call hierarchical semantics. And I'll go into details what this is. But basically, one issue that I was mentioned, there's, it's a very nice phrase called lexical chasm and bridging the lexical chasm. This was observed you know, when, right at the beginning of the work on question answering. They observed that, surprise, surprise, the answer does not have the same words as the question. Right? So if you ask a question about cooking, they're not going to say cooking in the answer. They're going to say, well, take a pan, put some eggs in it, fry it. Right? So they're going to say words related to cooking, but not cooking. Right? So how do you bridge this lexical chasm in a robust way? So I'm going to talk about that as well. So here's one example. So suppose you have a question in the biology domain. How do, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this correctly. How does my elination affect action potentials? You, this is the correct answer. There is more you know, after that. But you see that it only has one word in common. Right? It's definitely not enough to rank this answer you know, highly. But if you look at the discourse structure, what discourse does, it breaks the text into segments, and it finds relations, discourse relations between segments. If you know that this part is actually elaborating over this on the topic of my alienation, you can find correlations between the discourse relation elaboration and how-to questions, and know that an elaboration on the topic mentioned in the question is a good answer. Furthermore, even though they don't have answers in common, if you have a lexical semantics model, you will understand very easily that they're all both in the same semantic space, you know, talking about neurons. Right? If you understand that, that you're already, you know, you're capturing two things. You're capturing that this text elaborates on something, and that something 
is semantically in the space of neurons for both question and answers. All right, so before I go into details, let me mention the data that I'm using and the, the tasks, the corresponding tasks. So the first one is called community question answering, and it's based on Yahoo Answers. So we have a corpus of about, of about uh, 10,000 QA pairs um, with a minimum of four answers per question. The average is nine. And this data is, is awesome because we can use it for training. So the way it works, you, you ask a question, then a bunch of people answer. Some of the answers are really bad. But then the person who asked the question goes there and ranks them and says, this is the best answer. Right? So we take that as training data. Right? So we take the question and the, the best answer as training data so we can actually learn a model. And I'll, see, I'll show exactly how we train the model. But we have training data. We also have testing data. Right? Because we, we can take the model we trained, we run it over the test questions, and we see how many of the best answers we actually ranked at the, position, at the top position. Right? So this is a nice, very simple task that we can do. But it's actually quite complex, because you can have anything on Yahoo Answers, you know, including how to make your hair wavy. <laughs> this is a more traditional question answering task. This is run over a, a biology textbook. And here we do not have answer. Answer. So in order to get answer candidates, what we're doing is we're fragmenting the, uh, the textbook into paragraphs. And each paragraph becomes a candidate answer. Right? And this task is, in theory, much harder because we have tens of thousands of candidates uh, for each question. Right? Each paragraph is a candidate answer. Right, so in the questions in this domain were crafted by a domain expert, by a biologist. And we came up with, initially, with 200 how questions and 200 why questions. But then he dropped a few because he didn't find the answers in the textbook. Uh, importantly, these were developed independent of the textbook. We, need, we had an initial setup for this task where we had a, an expert develop questions by reading the textbook. It turns out that that task is too easy, because the expert gets biased. And they tend to ask questions that are phrased exactly in the same way as the question was. So we dropped that set, and then we went to a different expert who was unbiased. He didn't read the textbook and told him to you know, come up with 200 questions that start with how or why. And then we looked for answers. OK, so I'm going to talk about these two things. Let me start with the discourse processing part to detect if uh, the text is structured like an answer. So we're proposing this architecture, which sounds a little bit complex, but it's actually not. So what we're doing first, we're taking an off-the-shelf information retrieval system. We're using Lucene, in case you, know, you, you care about these things, to give a question retrieve candidates. So you can view this as Google, right? This is our Google, right? It's just doing word matching, right? We're simply reducing the search space. Instead of looking at you know, 50,000 candidates in the textbook, we're only looking at the top 20. The ones that have some context in common with the question. Once that's done, we use more expensive machine learning technology to re-rank the answer. So after re-ranking, say, the answer which was originally at position two becomes the first answer. Uh, because of the re-ranking model. And for this, we use a standard off-the-shelf re-ranking machine learning software. We use SVM rank. So our main contribution is in here. Right? We generate a bunch of features from discourse, and we use a shallow representation of discourse using only discourse markers, and a deep representation for discourse using an actual discourse parser. And we extract features from both. I will, I will show how that's done. And we also use a model for lexical semantics to bridge the lexical chasm between question and answers. Right? So all these generate features, which are dumped into SVM rank, which basically reorders the answers based on that. All right. So for example, if you have this question, how is CO2 first incorporated in a Kelvin cycle, the first answer after IR is this one. And you see why IR will pick that. IR is basically matching words. It's not very smart, right? So you see that you know, words are matched. So they, it looks like a good answer, but it's not. Right? It's not answering the question. After re-ranking, our system manages to bring the correct answer to the top position. Right? So that's, that's the idea. 
So in terms of discourse, we use two representations. We use a shallow representation based on discourse markers. In case you're not familiar with discourse processing, a marker is a word or a phrase whose function is to organize discourse into segments. So but, because, by, and, in, and so on, right? They basically fragment the text into segments that are related in a discourse uh, uh, analysis. And we also use a representation based on rhetorical structure theory. And we have a parser train on, on a, a rhetorical structure theory uh, uh, bank, which basically explains how, this, uh, how two pieces of text connect. And I'll, I'll show more, uh, more examples on this. And examples are elaborations. One text elaborates over what was initially specified in, in the other one. Attribution, who said that? Contrast, the second piece of text contrasts the first one, and so on. All right, so let's deal with the first one first, the discourse marker features. So for example, if we have the question, how do I compare two strings in Java? And markers, we have a fixed set of markers taken from uh, Daniel Marcus' PhD thesis. It's 100 and something. We take those and we match them in the answer. By doing this, we essentially fragment the text. We also use end of sentence punctuation as, as uh, segmentation uh, hints. And then we find how many of the words that's basically the content, QSEG is the content of the question where the content full information exists. We're trying to see how many of those words exist in the answer. Right? So here we only found one string. In the previous segment between by and uh, the dot, we didn't find anything, right? So from this, we generate a feature other, meaning this segment did not match anything in the question. By, which is just the marker, this segment did match something in the question. So we mark it as QSEG. This is just saying this matches the question, right? Remember that for now, we're using a very simple word match here. I'll revisit this after lexical semantics to see how we can do better here. But for now, let's just assume that this is some matching algorithm, whatever the matching algorithm is. Right now, we're just matching words. Right? And of course, this type of features can be done within a sentence, or you can go cross-sentence. Right? So if you go, the blue lines would be features generated in the same sentence. So this is other in QSEG, because Java appears in the question. You can go two sentences. So this is other in QSEG, because this matches. Uh, well, actually, this should be, sorry, this should be QSEG in QSEG. No, no, no. Yes, other in QSEG, because this is the marker that we use, and so on. Right. So if you go by, by then this, both these segments match the question, so it becomes QSEG by QSEG. Right? So basically generating trigrams. Let's call this shallow discourse trigrams. Right? So what you have in the middle is the marker. And what you have to the left and the right side of the marker are basically labels. Is that matching the question content or not? Right? So very, very simple stuff. There is no, nothing uh, fancy here. For discourse uh, parser, we use an existing discourse parser from uh, University of Toronto. But since then, we released our own. I think our own is better. But basically, this is what it does. So rhetorical structure theory works essentially in two steps. It first segments the text into, the, into uh, discourse units, right? using the same marker-based idea, but it's done automatically. So these are the segments detected for this uh, text. And then it recursively connects segments using discourse relations that are binary. Right? So for example, this is a contrast. Right? So if you know Java, you know that compare strings, this is another thing that pisses me off about Java. To compare strings, you use the dot equals method. But to compare numbers, you use equals equals. Right? So this is a contrast. And then this, this whole block is an elaboration of this statement. All right? So this type of trees are constructed automatically using the discourse parser. And then we extract features from this as follows. So this is an actual example from the system. Uh, from the same question uh, about my uh, elination, I think. Uh, so basically what we do, we run the discourse parser. So in this particular answer, the discourse parser finds two segments from the speed to the accent. And based on and comma, it decides it's, it, it wants to start a new segment. So it has the, the other new segment, uh, the red one. And then it assigns an elaboration relation between them. 
Now, using this type of discourse relations, we do exactly the same as we did before. We generate discourse trigrams. But here, we label them by the discourse relation, not the marker. And it's very important to generalize beyond markers, because I think in Jurovsky's textbook, they did an analysis where uh, they found out that about 60% of the discourse relations are actually not driven by markers. They're, they're basically between different sentences, or they're just the markers are implicit or just missing, right? So it's very important to do a deeper analysis of the text to understand exactly what type of discourse you have there. So here we label them uh, by the discourse relation detected. And exactly the same algorithm as before. This one doesn't match any words in the question, so it's other. This one does, so it becomes QSEC. Right? And this is done recursively. This is a very simple example, but you can imagine a longer text where you have recursive relations. And we generate a feature for each relation in the tree. Right, now for lexical semantics, I'll revisit this in the second part of the talk, but for here, we're, we're gonna stick with a very simple model. I, I covered this at the previous Friday I gave another talk, so some of you people are seeing this twice. But basically, we're using a recursive neural network language model, which is a mathematical implementation on distributional similarity. Now, you probably know what distribution similarity is. If you don't, basically it comes from the observation that the word is defined by the company it keeps, just like people, right? So uh, a word is defined by its context. So what you do in distribution similarity is you take a word, say you want to find the context for house, and you take a very large corpus of documents, and you look for all the instances of house, and then you extract all the words around it to the left and the right. Typically, you use a window of 10 words to the left and 10 words to the right, right? So that gives you a lot of context, right? It gives you hundreds of thousands of words that appear in the context. Now, what this natural, neural network language models, what they do, they do something smart. They take that huge context of you know, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of words, and they collapse it into a fixed dimension, say 200. Of course, this dimension don't mean anything now, but they, they give you actually a very nice way of doing math over the words, right? So now each word is compressed into a vector of, say, dimension 200. And you can plot them. You can view this in a two-dimensional, 200 dimensional space. You can plot them as vectors, right? And what they showed was that words that are semantically similar will have vectors that are closer together, and words that are not will have vectors that are farther apart, right? So in this example, photosynthesis and plant will be close together. Dog will be not. Uh, What's important in this, and they, there was previous work to show that this is important for question answering, and what's important in this part of the talk is that uh, I'm using this as a control condition. What this means is that if our hypothesis in the beginning that question answering is defined by two issues, is this an answer, and is this related to my question? Those are two different complementary issues, right? So if they indeed are complementary questions, then the results should be complementary when we combine these two. Right, and we'll verify this soon. Right? As another parenthesis, if you're interested in lexical semantics, there's a lot of work recently on this, and they showed that, uh, this is not my work, but they showed that in this semantic space, it truly, truly is a semantic space. So you see here uh, that countries are grouped together, cities are grouped together, and there are much bigger maps where you see that basically semantically related words are grouped together. All right, so just as a refresher, now we have features from discourse markers, which are shallow. You don't need much of an analysis to generate those. We have features from an actual discourse parser, which are deep because it's a recursive tree. And we have features from lexical semantics. So I'll revisit this soon. But for now, we're sticking with the neural network language model. <laughs> and we're, pump we're uh, putting the all of this into a re-ranker. All right, so let's see how it works. So we're looking at Yahoo Answers first. On average, we have about nine answers per question. So if you pick an answer randomly, you have a 40% chance that your answer is gonna be, the correct answer is gonna be on the first position. Seeing how many questions have an answer on the first position is called in the literature precision at one. Right? It, just, it just, just measures the precision of, uh, the, the percentage of questions that have the correct answer at the top position. Right? Very simple metric. If we do information retrieval, Again, we use Lucene here, but you can, you can replace this with Google easily, right? If you just do a 
traditional information retrieval model, you get close to 20%. So you get some improvement. Here it's one in nine, here it's one in five. Right? But if you start adding this course, it gets a lot better, right? So the shallow model gets 24.1, so it's another five points on top. This one does, <coughs> excuse me. The discourse parser does marginally better, but if you combine them, the combination does better. So this means we have <coughs> three sets of features. We have a feature from IR. Basically, this feature is just telling us what's the score given by the information retrieval model, what's similarity, what's, what's the number of overlapping words, to simplify a little bit. Uh, features that are shallow and features that are deep, but both discourse, right? So now we already improve by 10 points, which in, in this field is huge. Now, if you add lexical, this was all done without lexical semantics. If you add lexical semantics, there's a huge boost of seven points just from the neural network language model. So instead of getting 19.6, you're getting 27 for the same setup. What's cool here is that uh, if you add this course, it still works on top of this. So to some extent, they are indeed complementary, right? They're not perfectly complementary. Here we get the five-point boost. Here we get a two-point nine, a three-point boost, right? So they're not perfectly complementary, but there's still complementarity. About they are six, about sixty percent orthogonal, independent of each other. All right, so let's move on to the uh, biology uh, corpus. So these are the how questions. And you see a very, very similar story. Right? Here we get 27% improvement uh, over IR. And if you add lexical semantics, by the way, the improvement for lexical semantics here is much smaller because it's very hard to train a, a language model on the biology domain because we didn't have enough texts. Right? For Yahoo Answers, it's easy. There's a lot of open domain collections that you can use to train a language model. And we use, by the way, GigaWord, which has about 4 billion words in it, so it's large. But for biology, there isn't much. So we train on the textbook itself. We train on a subset of Wikipedia, which talks about biology, and that's about it, right? and a study guide, I think. So, they, so that's tiny. That's three orders of magnitude smaller than, than the other one. So because of this, the improvement is much smaller. But what's important here is that this course works in both setups. And it actually works consistently here. You get six points here, five points here. So based on, based on this ratio, we can say that this course is about 80% orthogonal with lexical semantics. So it seems to support our hypothesis that you want to look for two things. You want to look for the structure of the answer you know, driven by this course. And you want to look for similarity, how semantically similar question and answers are. And lastly, uh, for the white questions, this is in green because this is an awesome improvement here of 10 points absolute. And if you add lexical semantics, they work marginally better here. We still get a 7.6 improvement. So this course consistently helps. And I think this is the first work to show that automated discourse processing helps a real world tasks. So that, this was exciting. Now, a problem that we have with NLP, and very few people actually acknowledge it, is domain transfer. So what we tend to do in NLP is we train our parsers on tree bank or whatever you know, corpus you have, and you test on a held out subset of that corpus, but it's still in the same domain. Right? So of course, we're sort of fooling ourselves that our models are good. And when I was at Yahoo, we took those parsers and named entity recognizers, and we tried to run them on the web. And what you see in the literature, for example, for named entity recognition is that performance is 95 F1, which means almost perfect. When you run it over ra random web documents, performance drops to 70%. So we're not that good, right? So, and nobody really talks about domain transfer. It's one of the unsolved areas in NLP. So we tried to see how well this applies here. So what we, tr what we did here, we trained a model over the Yahoo Answers and then we applied it over the biology domain. Right? And the idea here was that this course should be somewhat generic, right? because the relations covered by rhetorical structure theory, at least the 18 major ones, they're so generic, they're domain independent, they're elaboration, contrast, attribution, 
and so on. So they should be domain independent. So if you train and test in domain, you get about 30% uh, <coughs> with, without lexical semantics, and a tiny bit better for uh, if you use lexical semantics. Now, if you take the model that train on Yahoo Answers and you just run it without training anything, you just run it over the biology questions, you get almost the same performance. I think this is one of the best results I've seen, in, at least in the field of question answering, to show that you can train in an open domain setting and apply in a completely different domain. And you do get some performance drop, but it's in the first decimal. All right, so that, that was very, very nice to see. All right, so the second analysis we did here was, <coughs> remember that in, in, the initial, in the experiments reported so far, we, we used a very simple algorithm to match uh, answer segments to the question, right? Are, do they have words in common, basically, right? So if you look at the question, how do dogs learn to bury bones, and you have the answer, puppies are natural diggers and something else, the current algorithm will label this as other and other, which is not ideal because this part is clearly related to the question, right? And it's sort of stupid of us not to to do it this way because we already have a lexical semantics model, so we can actually detect if words are related. So, for example, in this question, you can easily find out that the words most related to dogs are puppy, pet, and chew, right? So if you do that, you can already match it here, right? Very, very simply, just by picking the top words. So in that case, this feature becomes QSEG and other, which has much stronger signal than this more generic feature. Right, so we did that. And I think these are the best results to date on this corpus. So this is the model where we, we do the lexical semantics matching for the segments, for the discourse segments. And previously, the best result was 30.5. And now we, we're almost three points higher. All right, so this is, again, I think is the first work that combines lexical semantics and discourse. Uh, so basically, what we, what we did, if you pick a you know, just to put things in perspective, you pick a question randomly, you know, an answer randomly, have one in nine chance of answering. If you use a, an information retrieval, you have one in five chance. And here we reduce it to one in three. So we haven't solved the task, but there's definitely good progress from, you know, from what you can do uh, with the information retrieval. Another thing we tend to do in, in uh, NLP is to simplify our work. We focus just on things we can extract from individual sentences. Right, because that's where we have syntactic analysis, processing is easier, and so on. So we try to see what happens if you reduce our system to features extracted from individual sentences instead of going cross-sentence. So you see that performance drops a lot, so for, especially for the biology domain where answers are very long. This is almost zero improvement if you stay within a sentence and you get to 20%. It works marginally better here. For Yahoo Answers, it doesn't make a big difference. The reason it doesn't make a big difference going cross-sentence is because a lot of the answers are within a single sentence. So there just aren't any cross-sentence features in many cases. All right, so this is the end of the first talk. I'll go faster to the second one. But basically, I think this is the first work to show that this course is important for question answering. And it can be automatically done in an open domain way. And we also showed that cross-sentence features are important, and then it's complementary with lexical semantics. So this is the second shorter part of the talk, where I'm looking at how are the lexical semantics. Now, the reason lexical semantics works is because even though we call inference what we're doing with our brains, in many cases, we're basically just doing associations. right? So if, if you think about the word lecture, the first word that comes to mind is probably students, professors. right? You don't actually have a first-order logic system in your brain. You, you do have it, but you don't use it all the time. Right? So that's why lexical semantics works, because it learns this type of associations automatically. However, <coughs> they, the models we use so far told us that words are related in general, but not that one can be used to answer a question about the other. That's a special type of association. Right? So for example, this is you know, some questions from Yahoo Answers. This is, this is the answer preferred by IR. This is the answer preferred by our system. And you see that there are clear association between cook 
and many words that are not cook and maybe will not come to mind if you think about you know question answering, right? So it's salt, pepper, flour, skillet, pan fry, oil, butter, lemon juice, and so on. But if you wanna, if you ask a question about cooking, especially how can you cook something, what's the process of cooking? These are the words you want. Right? Now the question is, can we learn this type of associations automatically? And the intuition is very simple. This actually has been studied to death, but in a different context. It has been studied in the context of machine translation, where you have source language and foreign language, English to French, right? And now we're doing exactly the same thing, and our intuition is that the answer is a different language translated from the language of the question, right? So if the language of the question has the word cook, the foreign language within quotes of the answer will have words such as salt, pepper, etc. Right? So you can situation, then you can take an off-the-shelf machine translation model and translate answers to questions or, or vice versa, whatever you decide. Right? And that's all we did. And we learned this type of associations automatically. And we used IBM model one, which is probably the most basic machine translation model, and we use 100,000 question answer pairs from Yahoo Answers to train this machine translation model. <coughs> and we show that it significantly improves the performance of a question answering system. However, the data is very sparse. You can't really capture open domain knowledge with 100,000 questions and answers, right? It's, it's a lot of data, but it's definitely not what you know, right? You know more than that, right? Or anybody, or all of us together definitely know more than that. Right, so how can we go beyond the sparsity introduced by this type of alignments between you know, questions and answers? So this is work in progress that you know, uh, Gus and Becky are working on. This hasn't been published yet, so for this reason I'll keep it short because we're still working on it and we don't know where it's gonna take us. But the intuition here is we want to reduce sparsity through graph traversal. What I mean by this, you can take the output of the machine translation algorithm and represent it as a graph. What this means is that word one is likely to be translated into word two, which means that if word one appears in a question, word two will appear in, the ans in an answer. So there are, there are probabilities attached to the edges here. So word one could be translated to word three or to word five. Word two on its own, if it appears in a question, can be translated to word four, and so on, right? So if you do this, you build a graph with weighted edges. Now our intuition is, is that even though word one and word four are not directly related, we have never seen a question on word one in training where word four appears in, in the answer. They are clearly semantically related, right? Because just with one hop, through word two, you reach word four. All right, so this is the intuition. We're gonna do a graph traversal and get more neighbors for word one by looking at the neighbors of its neighbors. All right, so this is what's called a higher order model. This would be a first order, and this would be a second order. All right, we're doing, how many hops we're doing indicates the order of the model. It can be, and we have to contain the cycles. We have to control for the cycles. Yes. So to formalize, we're basically summing up the neighbors, right? So for a word W, we get its k closest words, meaning words that appear with the highest probability in an answer. Then we look at those words and their neighbors. And we interpolate the neighbors that word W originally has with the neighbors that these k words have. And we come up with a new set of neighbors called the second order set of neighbors. And you can repeat this as far as you want, right? So this is iterable. You can use the second order model to create a third order model, and so on. Right? So some of you are familiar with PageRank. PageRank is basically you know, the famous algorithm behind Google, but they applied it to web pages. But that can be generalized to any graph. And basically what PageRank says, if my initial state is here, and I loop this graph, I, go, I traverse this graph, including through cycles, to infinity, what's my probability I'm gonna end up on word four? 
All right? So you can use that algorithm to, uh, to uh, identify in general the probability that the word is your neighbor. But we tried that, Becky tried that, and didn't work. The reason it doesn't work is that you introduce too much noise in the system. So to control for that, remember that these probabilities are estimated only from 100,000 questions, right? So they're not perfect. So you want to control for the quality of the data, and we control it in two ways. We only look at the top neighbors, the words that are most likely to appear in an answer for this question. For example, here we might look at word two and word three, but not word five, because its probability is too low. And then we do not traverse the graph to infinity. We traverse it to a finite number of steps. For example, we traverse it twice, two steps or three steps, right? So we don't go to con what they call it, to convergence. Uh, so these are you know, different, immediate differences from page rank. So if you think about it, this is inference, right? Because if you, if you think about the shallow definition of, of inference, inference is reaching indirect evidence through the aggregation of direct uh, evidence. Right? So if here, for example, if you look at the first order model for the word dog, the neighbors are cat, puppy, squirrel, raccoon. Not bad. They're sort of tiny animals, all of them. If you look at the second order, you see that you reach words that are clearly related and you haven't reached before, such as uh, uh, canine and pet. And if you go to third order, you reach poop and other things. And, but still, relevant words, kennel and so on. Right. So it's, it's useful to go uh, higher order, right? So if results, uh, this has been tested only on Yahoo Answers so far. And you see how the performance nicely grows, right? So this is the same as before, right? So one in nine probability of picking the correct answer. One in five if you use the information retrieval model. If you use just the first order alignment model, it, it grows to 27. So it's already learning very useful alignments between words in the question and words in the answer. But if you go higher order and you expect you know, the second order neighbors and the third order neighbors, it goes from 27, 29, and then to 30. So that's a 10% 10, 10 relative improvement, which in my field is, is big. Right? This hasn't been integrated with this course yet. So again, this should go you know, improve even further if you use this course. So I'm going to stop soon. But basically where this research work is going, what Gus is doing, comes from the observation that you don't have to translate words. All right, remember that that machine translation model was applied to translating from cook to salt and paper. But sometimes words are ambiguous. Right? So to reduce ambiguity, you want to translate syntactic dependencies. So basically, you can view those as syntactic bigrams. So say, you can cook food or you, could cook, you can cook math. Right? And if you cook math, you probably don't want salt and pepper in the answer, right? So to disambiguate between those, you can build a syntactic dependency and translate cook food to whatever you have in the answer, right? So this is what Gus is doing, and this is actually working very well. And we show that these results are complementary to other lexical semantics models, such as the neural, ne uh, neural network language model. So they are capturing different things. And it makes sense to capture different things, because if you think about distribution similarity in general, <coughs> They capture the fact that two words are related in general, whereas what we capture with the translation models, we capture the fact that words are related in the question answering sense, that one is in the question, one is in the answer. So semantically, those are subtle differences, but they are different. All right, so conclusions. We approximate the curate task as two issues. Is my text looking like an answer? And is this answer related to my question? So the one was done using discourse processing. One was done higher order lexical semantics. So before I stop, just want to mention that I'm always looking for motivated students, uh, and I have funding. So if you want to do work like this, and actually we do have a big project right now doing bioinformatics, doing information extraction in the biology domain. So we're trying to basically mine the cancer literature and extract uh, using linguistic information. Uh, uh, contact me if you want to work with me.